So first, Herr Fischer, first Sie up, haben das I wichtigste Werkzeug. Would like to know um, yes, regarding German companies on in, in companies in Europe, uh, Europe in general, how common are these cyber attacks? I mean, we're hearing a lot of, about them. We hear a lot about ransomware. Um, maybe you, Mr. Schönborn, because you have the the direct um, communication with, with companies in Germany about cybersecurity. How common is it that a company today faces a cyber attack? Is it daily or is it how often is it? So, so, so normally you are having, uh, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, you are having cyber attacks. So, so it is more unusual if you don't have an attack. So uh, it is it is normal part of your life, and that's why it is so important that you think from the beginning on, um, how, do I, how do I enhance my information security to the appropriate level so that I can deal with it? And I think they are very strong partners. It is on the one hand, the Alliance for Cybersecurity. It is a private sector like KPMG and the other guys who are having lots of experiences. And I think also uh, BDE, the Federal Association of uh, Industry in Germany, is also doing lots of stuff there to support the companies there because this is just common. And Mr. Hambrecht, we're talking a lot about ransomware. Is, is ransomware still the, the biggest threat for, for European companies or is, are there other attacks we don't see because they're maybe not so uh, visible uh, like ransom attacks? Well, I would say we still have this ransomware attacks, uh, but I think it's very important to understand that it's uh, also from the attackers different uh, sectors of industry or governments uh, who are attacked in different ways. So if you look, for example, if you have this widespread attacks, which you had, let's say, with a Mirai botnet uh, uh, or with, with WannaCry, that sometimes that just by the pure mass, you can create in the end by ransomware revenue as a criminal. Yeah? On the other hand, you have this, let's say, espionage attacks, which are very dedicated, very sophisticated, we talk about advanced persistent threats. And then in between, you still have this, let's say, traditional uh, uh, botnets uh, and everything that is in between there. So I think if you look over all of it, um, you have one thing where everyone, like uh, Mr. Schimbom said, is attacked on a, let's say, uh, minute basis, you could say. And on the other hand, you have this very dedicated attacks on different sectors. And I think if you are someone as a customer, as a user, you have to think about your risks, where you're interested, and then look what defending measures are best for you. You mentioned uh, WannaCry. WannaCry was mentioned a lot in, in the talks also. Something I ask myself is uh, WannaCry used a security hole in Windows which was fixed long ago. So and, and a lot of big agencies, a lot of big companies didn't update their Windows systems. And it's, it's really a question for me, what does it make so hard to update your software? Maybe. Maybe uh, Mr. Schoenbaum or Mr. Uh, Mr. Kemp, you can, can answer that. I think there, there is a reason you can understand, and there are many, many reasons you can't understand. Let me start with that one. Um, you can understand. Um, normally, when these, um, in this case, Microsoft security updates show up, you as a user company, and let's say an application software company, do not really know what holes are fixed with that software. But maybe you have a lot of interfaces which you used towards Microsoft software um, as an operating system interface or as a middleware interface in your application socket. So you, you might be a little bit reluctant um, to ask your customers use a new uh, Microsoft uh, issue because they're not quite sure what happens with my application software. So that's a logical reason. But let me be open. Uh, that's uh, 10,000 to 1, or 1 to 10,000. The other 9,999 are not to understand. It's simply they didn't care. And um, everywhere where you don't care about a potential risk or a potential, potential danger, you, you should not be astonished that it hit you. So sorry for all those who were hit by WannaCry. Uh, it's hard to say, but Your it was fault. their fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's, it's uh, really challenging for the, for the IT departments because they are, 
um, in most of the companies, the, the IT has grown historically, mm. and you have a zoo of systems, mm. and they're not even aware of what kind of systems they have in their networks. So uh, it's, it's really hard. First step would be um, having a, a strong IT architecture and standardization. This would make things much easier. And um, we're only talking about office IT. If you look at the shop floor IT, it really gets difficult because um, you have production systems um, and you have a console uh, that is run with Windows XP. And uh, this, uh, this production system has a price of, I don't know, 10 million uh, euros. And you're not allowed to patch the system because then your, your production street will not work anymore. So you can't patch the system. So and that's, uh, we know of um, very big companies that have been hit by, by WannaCry because it's, uh, the, the networks were not uh, separated from each other. It spread throughout the office network and it uh, hit also the, the shop floor network. But was WannaCry like, um, uh, was it um, like awareness uh, raising incident that, that oh, yes. companies now, yeah, they're, oh, yes. do, they're investing more in security and do, doing more updates? Um, well, some, I know some of the companies that uh, have been hit very, uh, very much in public, they have started cybersecurity programs, and um, I think it's, um, it's a little bit cynical maybe, but um, those, um, those events need to, need to be there from time to time to show that it's really um, uh, a, risk, a real risk, and uh, I, I can only agree with Mr. Schirmo, we have like a background noise of attacks in the mm. internet, mm. Yeah, we, we've uh, there are um, statistics. If you if you put the systems into the internet, uh, after less than 10 minutes, you have the first dedicated attack on the system. So someone has scanned it, has realized what software is running on it, and then attacking the software mm. that is uh, on the system. Mm. Mr. Schumbum, when we speak about attacks against companies, um, we, we you mentioned the, the several levels, like they are really ordinary attacks every day, but they are also very dedicated and very elaborated attack like espionage. Um, is these kinds of elaborated attacks only hitting the really big companies? Or if I am a small, mid-sized company, I have to also to, to think about that and to, um, to protect me against these kinds of attacks? The backbone of the German economy are the small, medium-sized companies are the so-called hidden champions. And these backbones are having tremendous values regarding research and development, regarding marketing know-how, how to sell, how to produce, and how to become a bigger company. And these hidden champions are, of course, and they are also victims of very personalized and special attacks. If it is regarding ransomware, it is something else. And this especially because it is so easy. It is so easy. I mean, when we are speaking about hacking, you know, when I'm discussing with political guys, right, and I speak about hackers, they are getting so gloomy eyes, like my children when I speak regarding unicorns, it's like magic. Hacking is nothing magic. It is just using a weakness within the software or within the hardware. Currently we see both. And, and this is something the, the CEO or the owner of a company of small and medium-sized companies doesn't care about really IT because that's what they are doing on the operative level and therefore it is so easy to get into the networks of the small and medium-sized companies and there we are seeing also very sophisticated attacks and that's why we try to support them with the Alliance for Cybersecurity and all the other guys. But you, you spoke about software and hardware, but isn't isn't it that oftentimes the, the employees are also the weakness, like so, social engineering, if you write an email to someone and uh, fake like an email address, I, I, I'm the boss or whatever? I mean, as, as colorful as the life is, as colorful are the, the possibilities of attacks. You have, of course, very sophisticated attacks regarding starting with social engineering at the end using the weakness the person is preparing for them number one. Number two, you are just using the weaknesses because it is wrong configured. And then number three, it is just using a weakness, a zero-day exploit, as Mr. Kempf has just explained, for example, because it's available on the market you can buy. Just one example. And the 10 most sold office products, software products 
we have seen more than 1,000 weaknesses, leakages just last year. 1,000, the 10 most sold software products. We have a quality issue here. Um, Professor Hambrecht, um, if we look at the regulation of, um, of stock markets, we have a lot of regulations. If there's something like a, a company um, ne needs to, to um, send out ad hoc information, if, 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 they, uh, if, if the, um, um, what's, um, if they have problems like, like uh, not, not getting where they have their project, they project the, the, the um, uh, given revenue. Revenue, yeah. Um, so, but if, if you have a software problem as a company, if you have a security hole, there are no really regulations for that for, for, for inform the public or inform the um, investors. Or there's little, little regulation on that. Um, in, in Germany, we have now a law that says has some regulation on that, but in most cases, you don't have to, to inform the public. Is it, is it an um, error that we don't think about how companies should inform the public if they have a security hall? I want to answer this um, from a perspective where we are today in this sector. Um, I think it's something what um, I can very much explain. We are coming in this industry where we didn't think about cybersecurity in the past. Yeah? And the problem is that a lot of legacy systems are still in place like this. And if you look into this, even if you have big companies, the challenge is if you have your historical, let's say, infrastructure as a product, or if you take Microsoft as a producer of operating systems, then the question is you cannot just say, oh, now we make a new one, and then it's security by design. The other thing is what, what I mentioned when we think about how our business is done. Yeah? We spend a lot of effort in classical production to make safety into this product. And we have a lot, as you said, we don't have quality in the software hardware production, but we put it there. So I think that to answer this question, we have to ask ourselves, how should be in the future the model for developing and deploying hardware and software? So this means if a product comes on the market, it's something which is honestly sometimes a joke. Yeah? You get a product, and then you might get a smartphone, and you can even not patch it. Yeah? If it has a bug, you can throw it away. Yeah? Or the first thing is you have an online shop or a product on the market. The next day, you get patches. Yeah? So we don't have it in any other industry. Yeah? You would never buy a car when you have the next day to go to the garage to patch it. Yeah? So and I think this is something where we have to think what can we do? And this is something what, on one hand, we try from an agency level with awareness raising. On the other hand, we need something to push it with legislation. And this takes time. Look, since 2009, the BSI had an uh, opportunity to give warnings. Yeah? But it's not easy just to give warnings. You need a process behind. Yeah? If we talk about certification, it's one step. So I think we need to think more about how we get better products and push the industry, and on the other hand, to find some legislation which is proper to force a bit more in this area. I mean, there are two levels. There's, on the one hand, there are software vendors and hardware vendors. If you have a router or something, then there, there could be some regulation, like the password should be changeable, for, for, for example, where it's not the case at some webcams from China. But the other level is, if you are just a normal company using software, but and you have a, a, a break of your system, and the, maybe user data is in risk, they, I, I think there's no real regulation right now um, when, when you have to inform the public um, mm -hmm. if there's data um, in, in, in risk. Or is there, you, you're looking skeptical because the, the, there is regulation? Sure. So we, we, we have prepared, a, uh, the German gov federal government has prepared a cyber security strategy in November 2016. And there we laid down that um, there are two possibilities. On the one hand is that we are preparing the criteria on different kind of levels so that uh, when you are selling, for example, a traffic light, then you have to fulfill certain kind of criteria to sell it, especially if it is combined somehow with the internet. So um, what kind of smartphone are you using? Apple iPhone. How secure is it? No way. Okay. 
I don't know, because you, 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 you have no sign or label on a smartphone, on a TV what you're purchasing, on a washing machine. You have no clue how secure it is. And there we would like to, to establish, we're working very strong together with uh, BDE and with all the other associations regarding what are the line, right levels of certification so that you as the end consumers, together with TÜV for example also, that you as the end consumers can decide really how big is my risk appetite and how big is it not. And this has to be checked by, by, by independent auditors like TÜV, like KPMG and all the other guys so that the customer is saving the right value. And then, to be very clear, I'm a big fan of talking and regarding a cooperative solution. But on, if the cooperative solution is not working, in the real world it is very easy. If the brake in the car is not working because you need an update, the car manufacturer is reliable. In the cyber world, no one is really reliable. So we are also looking at, if we don't find the minimum standards appropriately, then we will think about getting the right liabilities and so on, together also with European partners like ENISA. Just to add one point on the liability. The challenge today is, if you go on a national and European level, and if you go, let's say, into this Brussels hemisphere of legislator and of the industry, Today, unfortunately, there's no majority for a liability regulation. And this means currently, every one of the hardware and software vendors, or let's say, at least everyone who is lobbying in this area, tries to argue not to have a liability regulation. And I think this is what Mr. Schoenbohm mentioned. It's currently very difficult, because on one hand, we have these small steps. But on the other hand, we have upcoming things like assisted driving, automotive driving, artificial, whatever, and we mix the traditional industry with our IT industry, and the question is how fast we are before we have another, let's say, blackout in this area when we put all this stuff together in the future. Anne Schönbaum, um, how are you... Hans Fischer. Sorry? I'm Hans Peter Fischer. Sorry. <laughs> Hans no Peter Fischer. Sorry. Uh, how realistic is it that we have a label to bring more transparency uh, into security? Because I, I, I think it would be very uh, difficult to, to, for anyone, like uh, TÜV or anybody, to really uh, test a hardware or software on security because it has so so complex. And, and is it really possible to have a label on it to bring more transparency for the consumer? Um, yeah, first of all, I, I've got to say I'm not a fan of regulation in general, um, because it, it has to make sense. But um, on the other hand, it's uh, many companies um, don't start with security measures unless they have to for compliance reasons. So uh, it's a good starting point. And um, the other aspect is um, the market pressure is not high enough regarding security. Um, if you look at, uh, at, at the stock market, for example, companies that have a cybersecurity event, um, the stock uh, loses a little bit of value and then recovers very fast again. So um, the customers are not really caring about the security of the products. So there's an awareness problem. Uh, people will still buy an iPhone or whatever, uh, whether it's secure or not secure. You're selling, you're selling stuff because of its features, because it's cool, not because of security. Uh, if, you, if you look at a car, if you buy um, a nice car, you, you buy it because of the engine and because of the design, but uh, not because uh, of, uh, of the airbag and uh, the safety belt, but you wouldn't buy it uh, if it had no safety belt, uh, no, no airbag. So um, I think um, to, to raise the pressure from the market, it would be quite, quite nice to have a, a security label. And, uh, well, you, you don't have to make it too complex. Simple things, for example, in the IoT world, you can, uh, is there a possibility uh, to, to patch the system? Are the, the interfaces secure? Are, are there no, no standard passwords and so on? Uh, those could be very easy criteria for, for setting up such a, such a um, certification. Professor Kempf, you, you nodded heavily when, uh, when um, Mr. Uh, Fischer. Mr. Fischer said that he is against regulation. U.S. Uh, industry Association also are not a fan of, of regulation, are you? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, I mean, you, you probably not be astonished that the president of the German Industrial Association is not uh, at, at the first second asking for a regulation or, or an IT security law or whatever. 
Uh, so my first attempt would be, uh, let's try to find this cooperative solution, as Arne Schoenbaum said. Um, and and, and let, me, let me do a, a short joke. Uh, sometimes when you talk about IT security, it is as difficult as trying to sell an insurance, insurance against hailstorm to a Bavarian farmer. The first question he will ask you is, can I make a hailstorm by myself? And when you honestly answer, no, that's not possible. A hailstorm just comes. Then the farmer answers, if that's the case, I prefer a fire insurance. So I think that pretty much describes the situation in IT security. Everyone is highly aware when he was hit by a security incident. As long as he is not hit, it, hit it's something which happened to all the others. And there's one point where I have a critical view to my own theory that the cooperative solution is better than a regulative solution. This one point is that um, with IT and networks, we are more and more and get more and more interconnected. So me, maybe that my security hole is not hurting me, but is hurting his company, like KPMG or, or uh, whoever. In the case so of that's a crucial issue, which we really have to look at. Nevertheless, I really would prefer, let me say, a kind of voluntary solution which mm. gives transparency to the user and okay. say, my software is proven, it has no backdoors, it is security proven according to the Grundschutz catalog or whatever. Uh, that's my preferred solution. Legislative action should be last, um, not only because of the point uh, which was uh, mentioned before, it will be difficult to find a European-wide solution on that. Professor Herbert, um, do you want yeah. to disagree on that? <laughs> I want to be more provocative. That's good. That's if, good if, you, if you look into the aircraft business and if you look into an aircraft, an aircraft is about safety and an aircraft is flying with a lot of software. And you have so many regulations on national and European level until an aircraft can really fly. And if you look into it, how the different carriers all over the world cooperate, you can see that there are two important things. One is, there are agencies who can ground an aircraft if there's a safety issue. And the other point is, if there's any kind of accident, the information is shared immediately between all without competition because everyone learns from this. So, my question is then, when does the BSI have the competence to ground software or hardware? So, and the other provocative example is, we talk about privacy for decades. Now with GDPR, you have fines, you have compliance issues, and the CEOs in the industry get nervous. So, this is just an argument that all this discussion about, we hope that soft legislation or discussion will work, if it's too late, then we are sitting here and crying. So the question is, how did we prepare in this changing world? And experience shows, if there's no stick, we will still sit there. And, and there are still, I think, still webcams uh, you can buy in Germany which have a hard-coded password in it. And, and I, I just think, shouldn't there be some regulation that you, at least this shouldn't be the case? Because if you if you buy like a radio or anything, it's always regulated so that it doesn't um, um, uh, has no negative impact on, on other people. So, but maybe we can can move on on, on next um, topic. There was an attack on a energy um, supplier, Netcom uh, BV, um, uh, last year and. They, they said that they got attacked, by, uh, and, it, and is, is there any, any information on who could be the attacker? Is it that there are states involved now in these kind of attacks, or is it that this were just regular criminals? No comment. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes, sometimes it's good not to discuss some, all the issues in the public. So. Okay. But uh, maybe you can vaguely describe if there is 
are there very professional attacks in Germany which could be state-sponsored? Yes, of course. But, but um, we, we made it very clear. We had a uh, tried attack which was not very successful December until February this year on the uh, German government, which we noticed very early and then we looked detailed what they did so far. It became public and it was um, put to a certain kind of organization in, the, in Eastern Europe, between Eastern Europe and Asia, the big countries there. And so therefore, uh, it, it became very clear, yes, there are state-sponsored attacks, yes. It is, you know, espionage is a very old business, right? In the past you did it directly with people and copied and so on, and now you do it via cyber. That is just normal. This is just normal, and that's why we have to prepare ourselves. But the state-sponsored attacks are not my, my issue. The biggest issue is the weaknesses what uh, Udo Helmbrecht has described, or Dieter Kemp, or uh, Mr. Fischer has described. The, the, the poor quality we are having, not thinking about information security from the beginning, cyber security by design, cyber security by default, life cycle and so on, cyber security. And when you think about the speeches we heard yesterday evening during the opening of SABET, it became very clear that we have to work on that information security as a precondition regarding digitization. And what interests me also is how does uh, agencies like BSE and also ENISA work together with private companies? There are private companies, antivirus companies, like a lot of discussion about Kaspersky, for example. Are they connected somehow to, to Russia? Uh, they are forbidden in, in uh, American uh, agencies now. Um, so, do, I mean, do, we have, do you work we, together? Yeah, but yes, yes, we work very close together. But, but honestly, I think we have to be careful. So if we say that there's a possibility that a, a company is using this, this information they're getting via the uh, cybersecurity companies, whom can I trust? Semantic, great company, US. Kaspersky, great company, Russia. Trend Micro, Asia. Checkpoint, great company, Israel. <laughs> G-Data, Bochum, owned by Kaspersky. Miss Kaspersky. Trend Micro, Japan. So tell me, whom can I trust? So, so it's always a question of regarding that we know exactly what they are doing and that we can analyze it, testify it, and so on. And honestly, for me, this is not the world we should live in. I mean, when we are thinking about the big, big infrastructure providers, whom should I use? Juniper, Cisco, or Huawei, or Nokia? So we have to analyze with it. We are living in a globalized international world, and we have to analyze it and deal with it and testify if they are doing anything wrong, then we have to publish it. If they are not doing anything wrong, we should cooperate and do it in a very cooperative manner. Mr. Fischer, you, your headquarters is based in Paris, am I right? KPMG is, is, is uh, based in, in Paris originally, and now all around the world, but... No, no, no. no? We, we, have, uh, we have a German company, uh, we have a headquarters in Berlin. Ah, okay. But we have an international network of companies, so we have an office in, in Paris. Okay, but do you have any tendencies to one of these uh, security? Uh, what is your advice to companies? If, if they ask you, who can I trust? Um, can I trust Kaspersky? Can I trust Symantec, uh, US-based? What is your advice? Well, uh, first of all, it's um, you need to identify uh, what threats you want to defend against, because. Um, State level espionage, uh, they have they have uh, the the meanings to get into your network. I mean that's that's not the natural enemy of a mid-sized company. Mm. So um, you have to be sure to, to have the basic security level that you have uh, all the, the, the script kiddies and and what I what I all earlier called the, the background noise of attacks uh, that this doesn't affect you. And then um, you have to look, for example, um, organized crime. Um, sophisticated attacks like um, APTs, um, you need to be able to at least detect them. So um, with a limited budget for security, you should um, do a risk-oriented approach, uh, not one size fits all. You have to look what are your crown jewels, what are the, the most valuable IT assets in your, in your company, and protect them very good. Um, you should share information. Um, I like this. I'm seeing Mr. Backofen from uh, Deutsche Telekom there. He said he talked about the uh, 
Allianz der Guten, I think that's, that's a nice thing. Um, the companies should exchange um, their intelligence to prepare because the evil do this in a certain way, but they don't have trust to each other, so maybe this is an advantage of the good. And um, uh, get the basics right. These are the three advices that I would give um, a mid-sized company. So an audience of, of good companies and, and good uh, <laughs> good world uh, agencies. Um, thank you all for uh, participating. Thank you for listening. Um, we will have a networking break now until 2.15 p.m. And then it will go on with Alex Steffen. Thank you again and thank you. Thank you.